he's here in our midst. Feel his presence. He's here. We thank you, God, for honoring us. Let us worship him, who he is to you today, who he is to all of us, our Savior, our Redeemer, our all.
Good morning, everybody. So good to be with you again today. I want to talk to you this morning from the book of Luke, chapter number 10. And uh, we're going to look at one of the most famous stories in all of the Bible, a story of the Good Samaritan. And I want to entitle my uh, message this morning, Mugging on the Expressway. You know, stories are amazing. And one of the reasons is the fact that stories help us in the learning process. We, we learn through concepts, but we also learn through stories and through illustrations. Now, great storyteller. Matter of fact, he told stories and parables throughout all of the Word of God. And the reason he told these stories was to illustrate a point that he was trying to drive home. For instance, in the book of Matthew, the Gospel of Matthew, he talked about the world of nature. And he talked about birds. He said the birds and the funeral of the sparrow. And he talked about how that he cared for them. And then he said, if I care for them, how much more will I care for you? And certainly we take uh, 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 thankfulness that God cares for us like he does for the animals. And then he talked about seed. He said, you know, there's certain seed that's planted and that seed when it becomes great. And he talked about the fact that's what the Bible is, that the Bible is a seed. God plants it in his heart. David said those words. He said in Psalms 119, he said, way by taking heed thereto, thy word have I hid or planted in my heart that I might not sin against God. And then he many times talked about current events. These are parables. Now, somebody often said, what, are, what is parable is an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. And such is the story that's laid before us this morning. It's a story that could be a headline in any major newspaper in our world because it's a story of hatred. It's a story of prejudice. It's a story of love or of compassion. Jesus always told a story in certain circumstances or in certain atmospheres. And many of them were answers to questions that were asked of him. Now the background of the story we'll read in just a couple of moments is there was a lawyer, he's very intelligent, asked a question of Jesus. Matter of fact, he said to Jesus, he said, uh, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Now that's the greatest question that we could ever ask or I get from this earth to God's heaven. And the reason that is so important is because there was a time when you were not, but there will never be a time when you will not be. You will always live forever somewhere with God or away from God. And the lawyer wanted to know, how can I make it to this place called heaven? How can I get eternal life? So the answer that Jesus gives to him is he responded to the question with a question. And he quotes from two Old Testament scriptures. One of them's all the way back to the writings of Moses. And in the Pentateuch, uh, in the book of Deuteronomy, uh, Moses wrote in the law, he said, the law is that you love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. He said, that's, that's the law. And then in the book of Leviticus, also the writings of Moses, Moses said these words, he said, thou shalt not avenge nor bear any grudge against the children of thy neighbor as thyself, for I am the Lord. So this man knew the law and he knew what Moses had wrote, written in, in Holy Scripture, that his job was to love God's neighbor. And so he asked, he's asking Jesus, this is what the law said, but what, what do I do about trying to fulfill? That's the problem all of us have. We can't keep the law. We fail. We fall short of the mark. We transgress. We, we break God's law. When you look at the law, the law says, do this and live. But it's not very long that we live our lives and we understand, I can't do that. I can't be the perfect. John said in the, God, the book of 1 John, if any man say he has not sinned, he deceives himself and the truth is not in him. We cannot keep the law. If you're trying to get to heaven by keeps or, uh, or by, uh, by obeying certain things, it's impossible. You can't get there. Matter of fact, Jesus said, if you've broken one commandment, you're guilty of breaking all commandments. And this shook this man. He realized he can't keep the law. Whereas we live in a day of grace, and grace simply says, Jesus paid it all. Oh. So this lawyer, when he asked Jesus, how can I get to heaven? And Jesus said, you uh, keep the law. This man said, man, I, I can't do it. So he's looking for a loophole, and then Jesus tells him a story. 
And the story goes like this. And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tempted him, saying, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And he said unto him, What is written in the law? How readest thou? And he answering said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy strength, and with all thy mind, and thy neighbor as thyself. And he said unto him, Thou hast answered right, this do, and thou shalt live. But he, willing to justify himself, said to Jesus, Who is my neighbor? And Jesus answering and said, A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell amongst thieves, which stripped him of his raiment and wounded him and departed, leaving him half dead. And by chance there came a certain priest that way, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. And likewise a Levite, when he was uh, come to the place, came and lied. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was. And when he saw him, he had compassion on him, and went to his wounds, pouring in oil and wine, and set him on his own beast, and brought him to, the, to an inn, and took care of him. And on the morrow, when he departed, and he gave them to the host, and said unto him, Take care of him. And whatsoever thou spendest more, when I come again, I will repay you, thinkest thou, was neighbor unto him that fell amongst the thieves. And he said, He that showed mercy. Then Jesus said unto him, Go, and do thou likewise. Basically, in that story, there are three categories of people that live in our world. I want us to look at those this morning, because this trip from Jerusalem to Jericho, to Jericho to Jerusalem, was a 17-mile journey. It was a drop-off way down in caverns of 3,300 feet. It was a very lonely and a very dark road. Matter of fact, in his word study, Weiss talks about this, this road as the bloody way. It's much like the world in which we live in. And so this man decides to take, and he's making his way down to this particular uh, locale where he's heading, and, and the Bible says these thieves were waiting in the, in, in the, in the uh, uh, cave. Oh, this man, they, they jumped on him, and they beat him senseless. They just beat him. The Bible says they beat him half dead. He, he, he basically was, was, was a, a man that, that was just about dead. He was never going to make it to Jericho. Never going to be someplace he was going to go because they took everything he had. Well, it just so happens that a priest, a religious man, a preacher, saw this man laying on the thing there, bloody and wounded. Obviously, he's in distress but rather than go to the man and help him, he passes by on the other side and totally avoids the man. A Levite, a very religious person of the day, sees the same sight. He sees this man. He's, maybe he's calling for help, but he's wounded. He's bloody. He's, he's hurt. And, and as, as he, he, he's laying there, he, the, 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 the Levite passes by on the other side. But the Bible gives a story here of one man called a good Samaritan. Now the Samaritans were basically hated by the Jews. The Samaritans were people that were a mixed race of Jewish and Samaritan and, uh, and uh, of Syrian, excuse me. And, and because of that, the Jews had a, a prejudice against them. They, they didn't want anything to do with them. Perhaps that's why the priest and the Levite passed by that way. But this good Samaritan sees this man and the Bible says he went to him, and he bound up his wounds. He, he soaked up the blood. He, he helped himself out uh, 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 to, to, in order to get this man so he was stable. And he had some oil, and he had some wine, and he poured it in his wounds. And when the man was uh, somewhat helped, he picked him up, and he put him on his own mule, and he took him to an inn. He took care of the man that night, and the next morning, he told the man that ran the inn, he said, listen, I'm going to give you this now, when I, when I, I'll pay you, but I will be back here, not after long, and when I come back, if it costs more money, I'll pay the difference. And then Jesus asked the great question, who do you think was neighbor unto him that fell amongst thieves? And he said, he that showed mercy on him, then said Jesus unto him, go, and do thou likewise. So I want to look at this building very quickly in the time that we have. There's three kinds of people in this world. 
and only one kind that we ought to want to be and the story about the Good Samaritan. And the first per group of people that we see in this world are the abusers in life. The Bible says in verse number 30, that Jesus answered, a certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell amongst thieves, which stripped him of his raiment and wounded him and departed, leaving him half dead. The philosophy of abusive people, like these people that, that beat up this man, their philosophy was, what's yours is mine, and I'm going to take it. Now, when we think about abuse, there's a lot of abusive people in our world. But I want you to understand, I mark this down big and plain and straight. The biggest abuser in this world is the devil himself. The Bible gives us these, this warning in the book of Ephesians. He said, uh, beware, get yourself prepared, that the devil walketh about like a lying, like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. And sometimes people often say, well, if the devil is so powerful, why, why doesn't he hurt us? I want you to understand this truth, that if the devil could, he would kill each and every one of us. The Bible says in the book of John, the thief cometh not but for to kill and to steal and to destroy. Satan's motive is to do anything he can to hurt you in your life. Now, if you know Jesus... If you're a child of the Lord, you're in the family of God, God protects you. I believe that the Bible gives us uh, guardian angels. And the Bible talks about angels throughout all the word of God that come and they, they protect us. It wasn't long ago, I, I, was, uh, I have an old Jeep and I was driving my Jeep and I had a cup of Wawa coffee, best coffee in the world. And I couldn't get it out of the, out of the holder and I didn't have a lid so I didn't want to spill it. And the next thing I know, I had run off the road. I was in a field and I saw a big, a big bump coming, but I figured I said, well, it's, it's my Jeep. I'd only had it just a couple of months. And boy, when it went up in the air, I was fine. But when it came down, I went up and I hit the top of it and it just knocked me out. I mean, I had blood coming out of my head everywhere. And I remember waking up and I was flying through a field toward the woods and I slammed on the brakes. Now, I believe that it, angel woke me up because if it hadn't if I'd hit a tree I, I'd have been in a whole heap of trouble and you say I, I just don't believe that well that's fine but all of us can think of times in our lives where where angels have came to our rescue and it was just a miracle that we we got through that but the devil is after us he's an abusive person he will abuse and use and try to seek to destroy. And I want you to understand this, that if you do not know Jesus, you are prey to the dirty, rotten devil. You are, you are there for him to, to, to kill and to destroy. And the only reason God has allowed you to live this long is because he wants you to come to him as your savior. But to those of us who know Jesus, the devil cannot hurt us. They overcame him, the Bible says in the book of Revelation chapter 14, they overcame him by the word and by the blood of the Lamb, name of Jesus Christ. And so we don't need to live in the spirit of fear. You may think, uh, I need to fear the devil. No, the only person we're told to fear is the holiness of God. And it doesn't mean to shake, but it simply means to give him the awe and the respect that he is due. We don't need to live in fear of, of, of the devil because greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. And, and uh, I remember years ago, we had a family come to our church. Their name were the Irwins. They, the guy played the guitar. I remember he played it left-handed and he had his family sing and he was preaching one morning and he told a story, I've never forgot. He said his uncle was a plumber. This was down in the Texas area, the Dallas area. And Dennis said that his uh, uncle was called to come to a, to a, 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 a prison uh, where they kept people. And uh, he said uh, that, that the plum, there, there was plumbing that needed to be done. But before he went out into the field and fixed some of the things that need to be fixed, the, uh, the, the man that was in charge said, now listen, there's a man here in this prison that is a killer. He, he recently killed his mother and his father. And to be really worse, he cooked them and he ate them. He said, now he's sedated, but he's out there and he's amongst all the prisoners in the compound 
And so when you're out there, kind of keep your eye on them. Be careful. Well, his uncle said, I, I figured that the guy knew what he was talking about. And so I, I, uh, I, uh, I went out there and he said he watched. That man kept an eye on me all morning. He said, I ate my lunch that afternoon. He, he was looking at me and I noticed he began to walk my way. And I thought, well, maybe he's just coming this way. And he said, I got a tightness in my stomach. I got nervous. I got, I got worried in my stomach. And, and uh, uh, he said, but, but he started to come closer. And he said, it wasn't very long that he began to run toward me. He said, I, I picked up a wrench and I realized that he's a big guy. I was no match for him. So he said, I turned around and I started to run. And he said, I turned around and he was running after me. He said, I ran into the, to a building where the door was open. And he said, hoping that that would keep him out. But he said, this, this crazy murderer, uh, insane man came into the building. He could hear his footsteps as he, he ran through the hallways and he would take a corridor and this man would take the corridor. And he said, he finally went into a room hoping the man would not find him, but the man found him. And he walked into the room and Mr. Ir Pastor Irwin's uh, uh, uncle took a, took a monkey wrench, big wrench, and he howled it above his head. He was, gonna, he was gonna pound the man. And the man walked up to him and said, you're it. He was just playing tag. And you see, the devil sometimes is abusive. He likes us to live in the spirit of fear. First Timothy 1 Timothy 1.7, God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of love and of might and of power. We can't live in the spirit of fear. And there are, there, he, he is an abusive person. But in this world, there are abusive people. Their philosophy of life is what's yours is mine and somehow I'm going to take it away from you. We live in a world where there is an abundance of victims. Abundance of victims. And be careful of abusive people. Stay shy of them. Watch your little children. Watch your, um, sir, watch your wife. And, and uh, sir, watch yourself. Stay away from abusive people. Their philosophy is they don't care how they get it. But whatever you have, they're going to get, and they won't be sorry that they got it. You know, years ago, I went to college to study to be a, a preacher. And uh, while I was there, I, I got a job at, with a very good company, United Parcel Service. I'd work at 10, 15 at night to 5 in the morning. It was a great job. They were good people. This was back in the, the 70s. And uh, I uh, would get off work. It was still dark. And I always had a couple of guys that rode with me. I had a little, little uh, Toyota car, five speed on the, or uh, I guess it was five or four speed on the, on the floor. And uh, we'd always make it a, a, a habit on Fridays to go to the, uh, uh, the restaurant called Dunkin' Donuts. And they had a thing, you get a bowl of soup, you get a donut, get a cup of coffee for, and a piece of bread for a dollar. So we decided we were going to do that. And so we, we went and uh, pulled in this Dunkin' Donuts and I got some soup, I got a piece of bread and, and it was early in the morning. It was daylight by now. And um, I, uh, I said, guys, you all done? And they were all done eating. And, and so we, we decided we were gonna leave. So when we left, I didn't see any cars coming. I pulled out and when I did, a car come racing along in a black Cadillac. And he almost took me out, but he swerved around me, came up to the red light and slammed on his brakes, scared me to death. And I, I kind of hit the horn. I was aggravated. I just, I shouldn't have. But you know, when you're 20 years old or how old, ever old I was, you, you do stupid things. And I beeped the horn. Well, I thought the guy was reaching over to lock the door because we were beeping the horn. There were three of us. And then instead he came out of the, the, the Cadillac brandishing a gun, a firearm. It was a real gun. And I said, holy smokes. He came, walked over to the car. He took that gun and he smashed the window where I was sitting and he laid the gun to my head. And I remember my boss in Oklahoma where I took a job teaching. He said, you should have looked at him and said, You'd be better off holding a candy bar because when I feed it to you, it's going to taste better. But I did not feel like saying that to that man. He said, why don't you go ahead and beep that horn now? I wasn't going to touch that horn. He said, back that car up. I backed the car up. He took his gun and fired a shot right into the radiator of that car. Then he jumped in his car and he took off. 
and and uh, he he was high or on on he was on drugs or he was uh, uh, inebriated from alcohol. I don't know. I remember when he took off one of the guys with with uh, was his name was Phil. He said, "Follow him. Let's get his license plate." I said, "Man, let him go." He was an abusive person. And you will run into abusive people in this world. And if you are an abusive person, stop being that way. That is not a way that a child of God should live his or her life. We need to love people. We need to care for people. And remember the golden rule, treat others as you would have God or have others to treat you. And so don't live with abusiveness in your life. But these men jumped this poor man. They left him dead. They didn't care that he was, whether he was going to die. They didn't care. They didn't care that they took his money, took anything he had that was of value. They didn't care. There's people like that in this world. But then there's a second group of people that, that, that were there that day. They're what I call the avoiders in life. The Bible says, and by chance there came a certain priest that way. And when he saw him, he passed by on the other side and likewise, a Levite, when he was at the place, came and looked at him and passed by on the other side. So here's this priest, this religious man, maybe full of prejudice, I'm not sure, maybe full of hatred, I'm not sure, but, but, and, and this Levite, and, and evidently these were church-going men. These were men that knew God's law. They, they knew the writings of Moses, the Pentateuch of Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. They were faithful to the house of God, but yet these men had no compassion whatsoever. They had no compassion whatsoever. And you know, sometimes there are in this life people who are not abusers, but they're avoiders. Their, their philosophy, what's mine is mine, and I'm going to keep it. They're just holding on tight to everything they have. And I think sometimes it's good for us to ask ourselves this question. Does going to God's house change my attitude and my outlook toward other people. I'm sure they had good excuses. I'm sure they had a schedule to keep. I'm sure they were worried that perhaps if they helped him, maybe those men would come out and would, would get on them. And I'm sure they were very busy. But you know, there are people in our society that retreat away from helping other people. They, 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 they basically have the philosophy, just leave me alone. I don't want to be hurt. Just, just let me go. And so to do that, when they see people that have a need, when they see people that are in distress, they, they avoid that lest they themselves get hurt. But I want you to understand and mark this down big and plain and straight. God made us to relate to other people. God didn't make us to circle, put ourselves inside of a circle and not bother with anybody in this world. God doesn't want us to avoid people. Jesus made it very clear. He said, uh, don't fail to help somebody that needs to be helped when it's in the power of your hand to help them, whoever that may be. If you're a child of God, maybe perhaps God will send someone you to be lifted up, somebody that has a broken heart, somebody who you, you see sitting in the church service and they're, 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 just, they're kind of a a, a proud group. I don't really want to bother with him. He doesn't talk to anybody. She doesn't talk to anybody. Reminds me of the old song we used to sing, Down in the Human Heart, Crushed by the Tempter. Feelings lie buried that grace can restore. Touched by a loving heart, wakened by kindness. Chords that were broken can vibrate once more. Don't be an avoider in life. Be someone that helps people. Don't, don't just say, I, I'm having a tough time too. I, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking of nobody but myself. In my, in my marriage, in my, with my kids, with my job, with my money, with all I do. I just think of nobody but myself. That's what the priest was thinking of. That's what that Levite was thinking of. They said, I, I don't want any parts of that. That, that could get me in trouble. I, I don't want any parts of that. I'm going to pass by on the other side. And here's this man. He's hurting. He's bleeding, he, he, he's bloody, he's, he's hurt, and he needs somebody to come to his rescue. But they trained religious men. They knew the ways of God. They knew what the Old Testament law said in Deuteronomy and Leviticus. But they said, no, I just, I don't want anything to do with it. And how often people pass us by at work. How often people pass us by in our neighborhood. 
how often people pass us by in our church services. And our attitude is, no, I'm just going to avoid that. I, I don't want to get involved in somebody that needs help. But there's people that are desperate. They need help. They need somebody to love them and to show them the love of Jesus. Now, there was a third group that day that were there on the Jericho Road. It's not the abusers who beat that guy up. And not the, the uh, 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 avoiders who just totally avoided the situation. The assisters in life. They, th this man, this good Samaritan, decided that he was going to help this man. And it was probably going to cost. He said in verse 33, But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was. And when he saw him, he had compassion on him. Now he told this to Jesus. And, and uh, 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 or, or they, 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 uh, this man told Jesus, who is my neighbor? And Jesus is describing to him, this, this man was what a neighbor is all about. Now remember, the Jews hated the Samaritans. Matter of fact, two of the disciples said, Lord, would you do us a favor? Would you send down fire on the Samaritans and destroy them? Just consume them. They hated them. But this man, he had compassion. And you see, none of this was by happenstance. God arranged all of this. There's things that God does. God sends certain people our way. God puts us in certain jobs. God puts us in certain places where he says, I put you there to be a light. I, I put you there to be salt. Don't, don't abuse people. Don't, don't get to the place that you avoid people. I put you there to help people. You see, something we don't understand. God gives us money so that at times we can help people. God gives us talent so that we can use people. And the picture here really is what love is all about. Love is never measured by what it takes. It's always measured. And I wonder if we look around at other people, do we have compassion? Do we really put ourselves in the place of other people? People that are struggling, people that have difficulties. And this man, he went to him, and, and to, to, to go to him, he was going to have to show him some care. He would have to uh, uh, about bind up his wounds. And, 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 and lift him up and, and put him on and put, pour in some oil and some, and some wine. And he, he was cleaning the wounds and he carried him to an end. And I want you to mark this down. If you become an assister in life, it will cost you something. Dents pay great rewards. It'll cost you something. Back many years ago when I became a pastor, I was 29 years old in town. And uh, I, I didn't know what I was doing. I thought I did, but I, but I didn't. And I the church to come up. We would, we would march out uh, of the choir loft. The choir would go in, and then the, the pastor and, and uh, music man would, uh, would, would walk in. And I, I, I remember I, I was ready to two or three weeks. I was brand new. I was a fledgling. I was a kid. And I remember there were two men talking there. And I could hear, and they were talking. And the one guy said, this guy's in over his head. Me. And, and the other man said, what do you mean? He said, he doesn't know what he's doing. We needed science. We needed somebody that had a little bit of, of, uh, of knowledge of what's going on. He doesn't know what he's doing to, to help build a church here. And I remember the other man, his name was Charlie. He looked into me, he said, hey, listen. We thought we were doing the right thing. I think we did. And sure, he's young, but we can help him. Let's just be there to upgird him and, 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 and help him up. His name was Charlie Haynes. And you know, for 35 years, that man was a deacon in that church. Man, I can still remember the days that he'd pull his Ford truck up. He always drove Fords. He thought they were the greatest thing since sliced bread. He'd have that big dog inside there. That dog was, was, I never did mess with that dog a whole lot. I love dogs, but not Charlie's dog. He'd come in, he'd say, Pastor, I don't really think we ought to do that. 
I'd say, really, Charlie? He said, no, no, let me help you out a little bit. The people in this area, they, d- they don't like change very much. And I can tell you for 35 years, he did nothing but assist me. He, he, he's at the bottom. And I really didn't know what I was doing. I was trying, I was educated, but probably beyond my intelligence. He would, he would pour in oil and wine in my spirit. And whenever he left my office, I always had the attitude, I can do this. I buried her many years ago, and then just last year, I visited Charlie. I remember his last request to me, he said, Pastor, would you do me a favor? I said, Charlie, what do you need? Would you go to the store and buy me a Hershey's with almonds? And I went and I bought a couple of candy bars, just candy bars. I gave it to that dear, dear man. He was farmer of the year one year in the state of Maryland, had a huge farm. And he told me, he said, I I don't hurt, but I just feel real weak. And I said, well, look, I'll come back tomorrow. Then said, Charlie's in the hospital. I ran up to the hospital to see him. He was unconscious, but he died that night. But he was somebody who, who cared sister. Now I want you to understand, like this good Samaritan, He left this man. He didn't know his lot in life, but he told the innkeeper, he said, listen, I'm going to pay, but if it costs you more, I'll pay you when I come back. It was back in the day when man's word was his bond. When a man said he'd pay you, he paid you. And he went back and took care of this man. And I ask you, like I ask myself this morning, what kind of a person are you? Are you an abuser? Are you an avoider or are you an assister? The truth is none of us have that kind of love without being a Christian. And I tell you this today, like this man came to Jesus, he said, Master, how can I have eternal life? And I'm reminded of the words of Jesus with Nicodemus. He said, Nicodemus, marvel not that I say unto you, you must be born again. And I tell you here today that if you're not a Christian and you don't know Christ as Savior, the kind of love that I'm talking about is divine love. It's love that God places in our hearts. It's love that that causes us to be together as a church, to, to love our church, to love our pastor, to love our staff. It's the kind of love that sees needs and is willing to make that need met. And the way to live your life is to love people. Who is my neighbor? It's the end of my path. Father, help us and encourage us today and help those who've heard the broadcast today to know you as Savior. And if not, just to pray this prayer from their heart, dear Lord. I know that I'm a sinner, that I believe that Jesus died for me. Ability, I ask that you come into my heart and take my sin away and save me and take me to heaven when I die. In Jesus' name and amen.